This begins a series of videos on the Book of Deuteronomy. The Book of Deuteronomy consisting of speeches of Moses after the 40 years of wilderness wanderings. Title of Deuteronomy. The English word Deuteronomy means a second giving of the law from Deutero second and nomos law. Perhaps one of the reasons for this is you have a Ten Commandments repeated in this book in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And other laws are similar to laws in earlier in the Pentateuch. The Hebrew title takes the first several words, as is the custom in the Hebrew Bible, and it begins with uh, the Ele HaDevarim, and these are the words, but it uh, so it gives the title Ele HaDevarim, or just shortens that to Devarim, words. Not a terribly useful title for the book in Hebrew. Setting of Deuteronomy is on the plains of Moab. As we said chronologically, we have come to the end of the 40 years of wilderness wanderings described in the book of Numbers. And now we're ready to enter the land and the very next thing will be to attack Jericho, though that will take place after Moses dies. The first book consists of speeches of Moses that took place before his death. Shortly before his death, Moses gathered the people, exhorted them to be obedient to God, he repeats and elaborates on many of the laws. And this series of speeches uh, took place over probably just a, a matter of days. Now, on the authorship of Isaiah, we've discussed this already uh, when we had the discussion of the documentary hypothesis, but uh, we'll say a few things specific to Deuteronomy here. Uh, the modern conservative view is that Moses wrote Deuteronomy, though with some subsequent editing. And you can actually see this in the very first verse, where the narrator begins by speaking. These are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel beyond the Jordan. We've also commented that it seems improbable that Moses wrote the account of his own death in Deuteronomy 34. Rather, one can distinguish Moses from the narrator, who is presumably a different person than Moses himself. Now the Wellhausen school uh, takes a very different approach to the book as we've already seen. Wellhausen describes most of the book of Deuteronomy to D. And Wellhausen followed the proposal of DeWitt, uh, DeWitte who uh, proposed that Deuteronomy was a pious fraud that put the words of uh, 7th century B.C. Jerusalem priests into the mouth of Moses. The Vitae dated the book to around 621 B.C., the time of Josiah when they discovered the law of the Lord in the temple in Josiah's day. And the purpose of the book, according to De Vitte and Wilhausen, was to centralize the worship to Jerusalem. Key verses, Deuteronomy 12 and verse 5, that you are to worship the Lord your God only at the place that the Lord your God chooses. Now conservatives respond to this approach by saying that it is theologically unacceptable. It makes scripture wrong and deceptive. After all, DeWitt himself said that it made the book a pious fraud. A pious fraud would be unbecoming of a book of the Bible. Moreover, the liberal view is exegetically unnecessary. 
their view of Deuteronomy 12 and verse 5 is wrong because Deuteronomy doesn't centralize the worship in quite the way that the, the Vita proposal says. Rather, Deuteronomy allows secondary altars besides the altar that's in uh, Jerusalem. For example, in Deuteronomy 16 and verse 21, do not set up any wood, wooden Asherah pole beside the altar you build to the Lord your God. Well, that assumes that there are other altars that they're going to build besides the altar in Jerusalem. Likewise, in Deuteronomy 27, verses 4 and 5, when you have crossed the Jordan and set up these stones on Mount Ebal, as I commanded you today, and uh, coat them with plaster, build there an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. Do not use any iron tool upon them. Now these two verses in uh, Deuteronomy 16:21 and Deuteronomy 27, 4 and 5, they indicate that there were other legitimate altars contrary to the Levita theory. Now, for that reason, uh, he has to exclude these verses from original D in order to maintain his theory, but they contradict his theory uh, outright. Moreover, Levita's 7th century date for Deuteronomy can be challenged, and we'll discuss that uh, below. A more plausible explanation for Deuteronomy 12 exists. Uh, De Witt's proposal is essentially a conspiracy theory. Such theories make for dramatic fiction, which is why such theories op often capture people's imaginations, but they are rarely, if ever, true in reality. Over time, the truth comes out. De Witt assumes this conspiracy was kept secret until he cleverly discovered it over two millennia later. Well, this is inherently unlikely. A British scholar by the name of McConville uh, gives us a better explanation. Deuteron Deuteronomy 12.5 does not prohibit non-tabernacle altars but rather it expresses the idea of religious unity. The contrast is not between many altars versus the one, but between Canaanite altars versus God's altar. Deuteronomy 16.21 and Deuteronomy 27.5 show that other altars were tolerated even by Deuteronomy, just as earlier all the way back to Genesis, there were altars in various places. However, the verse in Deuteronomy 12.5 may well be predictive that uh, other altars' days are, shall we say, numbered. In 1 Kings 3 and verse 2, it says that the people... However, we're still sacrificing at the high places because the temple had not yet been built for the name of the Lord. And this would seem to imply that uh, sometime in the future, when the temple was built for the name of the Lord, uh, the high places would, would go away. But it doesn't, uh, even if Deuteronomy 12.5 is a prediction of that, about that, that uh, someday you're going to only worship the Lord your God at the place that the Lord your God chooses, it doesn't mean that in the meantime that other altars might not be legitimate. The reforms of Hezekiah, and especially that of Josiah, brought this prediction of centralizing the worship to Jerusalem uh, to fruition. Now, the covenant structure of Deuteronomy suggests that it may have a second millennium date rather than a 7th century date, as uh, the Wellhausen School suggests. 
George Mendenhall and Meredith Klein compared the biblical covenant with Hittite treaties, and especially Klein uh, saw a connection with Deuteronomy. Mendenhall argued that God's covenant with Israel was like treaties made between suzerains or overlord monarchs and their vassals among the Hittites. Meredith Klein observed that the parallels with these Hittite treaties are, uh, are, are similar to the structure of the book of Deuteronomy itself. The Hittites were a group of people that occupied what is now Turkey, Anatolia, in the 13th century BC. Uh, Ramses in the thir I should say Ramses in the 13th century BC fought fought with the Hittites over control of Palestine and the Levant. The Hittite treaties tend to have this kind of a structure. It would begin with a preamble, which would uh, uh, describe what uh, the treaty was about. It would have a historical prologue in which it would uh, uh, describe the what, historical things that uh, led up to the making of the treaty. Then it would have general stipulations as to uh, what the obligations of the parties were, uh, uh, which would include uh, you know, paying obeisance to the, the Hittite suzerain and paying tribute to him from time to time. But then it would be, there would be specific uh, stipulations, which would say in detail exactly when and how you were to do the stipulations that are uh, a part of the treaty. There would be blessings and curses, especially curses for disobeying the stipulations of the treaties. There would be a document clause that would call for uh, bringing out and reading the uh, treaty from time to time. And then there would be witnesses, particularly divine witnesses, that the gods were witnesses of the treaty that the, the parties had made. Now that's the structure of uh, the Hittite treaties. And Klein uh, argued that, well, that's exactly the structure of Deuteronomy, that it begins with a preamble, then it has a review of uh, God's uh, the relationship between God and Israel, a uh, historical prologue in uh, chapter 1 and verse 6 through chapter 3 and verse 29. Then it gives general stipulations, uh, basically a pep talk as to how you should listen to the voice of the Lord and obey his commands in uh, chapters 4 through 11. But that's followed by specific laws in chapters 12 through 26. That in turn is followed by uh, chapters 27 and 28 that contain blessings and cursings, especially curses for disobeying uh, God's covenant. And then you have a section in chapter 27 that uh, encourages the writing down of uh, what God has, has spoken here. Uh, for future reference is like the document clause in Hittite treaties. And there was no divine witnesses that could be used for Israel's covenant with Israel. But at several points in chapters 29 through 33, it calls on heaven and earth as witnesses of the covenant that they've made. So heaven and earth symbolically fit the structure of the Hittite treaty pattern. And the last part in Deuteronomy 34, the death of Moses, has no parallel in the Hittite treaties, but most of the book does, says Klein. And this has implications if you accept those parallels, though we will discuss those uh, implications in the next video.